Good day, everyone. This is the second part of our discussions involving variable costing. So you can see here on the picture the title, Absorption Costing and Variable Costing. Anyway, for the first part, we even differentiated the two costing methods in terms of the cost components. We also had illustrations as to when can one would be greater than the other and vice versa. And if they're equal, there wouldn't be any change. And in fact, we had examples. So for now, let us continue with our discussions about variable costing. So this is now with changes for the components. So example, let's revise the Harvey company example. In the previous example, 25,000 units were produced each year, but sales increased from 20,000 units in year one to 30,000 units in year two. In this revised example, production will differ each year while sales will remain constant. Okay, so let's have it. Okay, so they want sales to be constant, number of units produced 30,000. We can really say here at this point in time that absorption costing income will be higher by the unit cost of manufacturing. So that's 150,000 divided by 25,000, that's $6 per unit. If that's number of units sold as basis, of course, because a while ago, 25,000 where or was the number of units produced. Anyhow, so today or for this particular time, it's number of units produced at 30,000, so that's going to be five. So $150,000 divided by 30,000, that's five. The difference is 5,000 units in which produced or production is higher than sold or sales by 5,000, so 5,000 times five, that's 25,000. And absorption costing would be higher than that of variable costing, okay? So we have here the unit product cost of absorption is 15, while variable costing is 10. Similar to first part we're in, for variable costing, it will be lower than the absorption costing with respect to the per unit fixed manufacturing overhead. So even if there would be changes to the number of units produced, of course, the variable costing per unit would be equal. However, the fixed manufacturing overhead will change. It's because the production or the number of units produced changed. In fact, it increased. Therefore, the fixed would be as a total same, but per unit would be lesser or would decrease. So that's under cost behavior. Then this is the net operating income under absorption costing. So similar concepts again as to how do we get gross margin. So sales minus cost of sales less the expenses, operating expenses composed of selling and administrative to simplify the situation or example or sample. So we get the net operating income of $200,000. For variable costing, that's $175,000. If you can recall a while ago, I said that absorption costing will be higher by $25,000. That's $200,000 minus $175,000. $25,000 by the fixed manufacturing overhead cost per unit of five dollars times the five thousand units in which the production is greater than the sales so that's ending inventory of five thousand units all right then what about in changes in production in year two so sales is same at twenty five thousand units produced twenty thousand so in this case the manufacturing overhead per unit would change with respect to the number of units produced. 150,000 divided by 20,000. So we can see it here, it's 7.5. And that's the difference between absorption and variable steel. With the decrease of the number of units produced, we can notice that the per unit fixed cost increases. It's because in cost behavior, there is an inverse or indirect relationship between the total fixed manufacturing overhead cost with the number of units produced. So when one would increase, the other would decrease and so on. Okay, so absorption costing in year two, that's 150,000. 
and the number of units produced is 20,000. Can we go back to the given example? So we have here the beginning is 5,000 plus the produce of 20,000 minus 25,000. So that's zero ending, meaning there's no ending. However, they would still differ because of the difference between production and sales. We do not like compare it as a whole. If there's ending, we actually compare it in terms of production versus sales. So we have here the 150,000 under absorption costing while 175,000 under variable costing because the sales is higher by 5,000 units with respect to production. Therefore, that's going also to be the higher value of the variable costing over the absorption costing with 25,000. That's 5,000 units times $5 per unit. So all fixed manufacturing overhead is expensed. And this is the income comparison. As a total or whole, again, or once again, in year one and year two, whether there will be changes along the way, then it has to be equal in year two. So, or could be longer because of the differences of the values, but then they would equal some point in time and it's just a matter of how much was recognized in year one and year two. So conclusions, the net operating income is not affected by changes in production using variable costing. Okay, this is true because under the variable costing, we are going to expense entirely the fixed manufacturing overhead. The net operating income is affected though by changes in production using absorption costing even though the number of units sold is the same each for each year well the reason for that is because when sales would be changing and then production would also change or even if it won't but because of the difference of the two so there would be effects on the net operating income because there is going to be ending inventory. Remember, the basis for cost of sales is the number of units sold, not the number of units produced. Okay. Now, additional inputs would be impact on manager. Opponents of absorption costing argue that shifting fixed manufacturing overhead costs between periods can lead to misinterpretations and faulty decisions. Well, the point for absorption costing opponents is that they wanted to have a financial presentation that is based on sales. So that's why managers favored variable costing. But then the point of the first paragraph, I think this is opponents of variable costing. So the opponents of variable costing would be arguing that if we are going to expense the fixed manufacturing overhead, then that would lead to misinterpretations and faulty decisions. So that's why the proponents of absorption costing would be really arguing that the product cost should include the fixed manufacturing overhead. Hence, that is the reason why we are using absorption costing under the financial accounting and reporting. But then for variable costing, that's for the managerial purposes. So it's triggered by sales. That's why they wanted that presentation. And that's the impact to the managers using variable costing. Anyway, it's like two different fields. So we just have to respect. So use absorption costing for financial accounting and reporting. Use variable costing for managerial accounting purposes. Then what about the connection for CVP analysis? Well. Absorption costing, because technically that's under financial accounting and reporting, it does not support or make use of CVP analysis. Remember, CVP cost volume profit analysis is also one topic under managerial or management accounting. Remember also that CVP is similar and is anchored on variable costing, wherein fixed manufacturing overhead would be, of course, treated as a variable cost by assigning a per unit amount of the fixed overhead to each unit of production. So that's why 
absorption cost, they wouldn't argue that because what is fixed is fixed, right? So they wouldn't agree. Then the absorption costing proponents or those who agree with such would say that treating fixed manufacturing overhead as a variable cost can lead to faulty pricing decisions and keep or drop decisions because supposedly what is fixed again would not change with respect to production. Well, that's short-term analysis because you will know and actually you have known already in economics that in the long run, all costs would change. Like the CVP analysis short, term analysis could be one year or less, wherein some costs would be fixed and variable. That is because the period is very short. But in the long run, all costs would change. Anyway, going back, so that's the point. It would produce positive net operating income even when the number of units sold is less than the break-even point. So that's also the consideration there. So what's the point? Well, for the second one, we wouldn't be able to really realize that unless we see figures. Anyway, that's a possibility that can happen. Hence, absorption costing proponents wouldn't want that. For external reporting and income taxes, so we are using, of course, the gap requirements, which is absorption costing. This is a discussion in the United States, but this is also applicable in Philippines. Since top executives are usually evaluated based on external reports to shareholders, they may feel that decisions should be based on absorption costing. And also, for taxation purposes there in U.S., absorption costing is also used when filing returns. Anyway, this is under GAAP or external financial reporting, our accounting standards. Anyway, for management purposes, hence, normally there are two reports to be presented for external and internal. They are really into the variable costing and the contribution approach. So contribution approach is in accordance or in relation to the so-called contribution margin approach, wherein that sales minus variable costs and expenses. So the advantages would be that management finds it more useful because it is based on sales, consistent with CVP cost volume profit analysis. So any changes on the three items or any of the three, the cost, the volume would change the profit or the three of them together. The net operating income is closer to the net cash flow. In this particular sense, it is because we are on sales. Then it is consistent with standard cost and flexible budgeting in which we are going to determine the cost per unit. So we treat that all costs would be variable. Then easier to estimate profitability of products and segments. Well, it is easier because we would assume that all costs can change. Profit is not affected by changes in the, can I have that minimized? Inventories. Yeah. If we use variable costing, because the basis would be sales and then all fixed manufacturing overhead will be expensed. And then also the fixed selling would be expensed. No question about that. Impact of fixed costs on profits emphasized. So fixed costs are to be deducted as a whole. Then continuation. Under our GAAP absorption costing, we have to assign the fixed manufacturing cost to products so that we can properly match revenues and costs. This is under absorption costing. However, for variable costing, fixed manufacturing costs should be expensed should be treated as period because they are capacity costs and they will be incurred even if nothing is produced. So there is like a conflict, we would say that. But then shall we say that one is better than the other? It depends upon where we are. That's the answer. Then what about in relation to theory of constraints? So Theory of constraints is actually also another topic in our management accounting or managerial accounting that treats only the direct materials as the cost and the rest of the costs shall be treated as expense or as expenses or as expense immediately. Then 
but treating direct labor as a fixed cost for three reasons. So the direct materials only would be the variable cost, the rest would be fixed cost. Number one, many companies have a commitment to guarantee workers a minimum number of paid hours. Yeah, that could be true that there is only a fixed set of working hours and the payment will be fixed. Number two, TOC, theory of constraints would emphasize that in order for us to be able to have better quality and faster production, quality of products, of course, faster production of the products, then we are going to focus only on the direct materials as something that would change, but then the rest could be fixed. So that's why the theory of constraints emphasizes the role of direct labor in continuous improvement. Fluctuating levels of direct labor can devastate morale and defeat the role of employees in continuous improvement efforts. So if we are going to allow the direct labor cost to fluctuate or change, like many times, that would destroy the morality and that would destroy, of course, the morale. If not morality, of course, that's another thing to think about. So that would also have impact on their motivation. So that's the word as emphasized in number two. Also, I would like to add that theory of constraints really would deal also with removing the bottlenecks or the constraints or the limiting factors in the operation so that we can have smooth operations. Then number three is direct labor is usually not the constraint. So again, materials could be constraints or the possible constraints. Then what about if you are using JIT inventory methods or just in-time inventory system? In that case, there wouldn't be a problem between or there wouldn't be arguments between variable and absorption costing as well as the income and the reports that such methods would produce because production tends to equal sales because in GIT or just-in-time inventory system and method and philosophy, we are going to produce the products as there are sales or as soon as there are orders or sales, that's the time that we are going to produce the products. Hence, we can have zero levels of inventory or minimized inventory levels. All right. So hopefully you've learned something from our discussions for today. Thank you very much for listening. God bless us all.